We've looked at operating systems, networks, and hardware security, but we can't stay myopic forever. Systems aren't individual nuts and bolts, they're ecosystems, with many different actors involved in success or failure, security or insecurity. Who is in your supply chain, and how do you build systems and ecosystems that really work? And who do they work for, given the many actors in real supply chains? So an absolute classic example of a supply chain attack is this device here, the IBM Selectric, which was, as it turned out, uh, bugged by the Russians in the US Embassy in Russia. The operation that discovered this was called Operation Gunman, and the US knew they were being bugged because things were leaked that couldn't been, have been known otherwise, but they weren't sure how. So they secretly dismantled every single device in the embassy and secretly replaced it with new devices to compare the difference. And what they found was that the typewriter bar inside had been hollowed out and replaced with a radio transmitter, which was revealing all of the keys inside here. It was one of the first key loggers. So what they thought were standard IBM Selectric typewriters weren't, and that's where their source of insecurity came from. In this book here, No Place to Hide, uh, by Glenn Greenwald, he describes an attack from the Snowden leaks of the NSA implanting backdoors into Cisco routers by intercepting the shipping. So it's not only manufacturer and once they've been installed that you've got to worry about, it's the very delivery of them is within your threat model. What we know from this is that things get really complicated if your adversary is well-funded and motivated. Uh, a quote from the Guardian article that uh, Glenn Greenwald wrote about this that's in the notes of the lectures is that uh, for years the US government loudly warned the world that Chinese routers and other internet devices pose a threat because they are built with a backdoor surveillance functionality that gives the Chinese government the ability to spy on anyone using them. Yet what the NSA's documents show is that the Americans have been engaged in precisely the same activity that the US accused the Chinese of doing. And a June 2010 report from the head of the NSA's Access and Target Development Department is shockingly explicit. The NSA routinely receives or intercepts routers, servers and other computer network devices being exported from the US before they are delivered to international consumers. And you can read more about that in the book and in the article. A third example of a complex supply chain attack is this one here on Supermicro motherboards, which uh, Supermicro have repeatedly denied over the years, uh, but Bloomberg are absolutely adamant that this happened and have published several articles over the last few years describing the attack. Um, well, what happened here is, supposedly, allegedly, is that uh, the motherboard had a chip implanted inside it. Uh, so it wasn't something that was on the surface of the motherboard, it was inside it. Uh, it wasn't in the processor itself, uh, so this was something that was altered at manufacture time. It wasn't in Supermicro's design. It was the factories that had been targeted to get the implant in there. And a question you might have is, is this easier than bugging the software? Wouldn't it have been easier to uh, break the BIOS or something, uh, which actually in this case had also been hacked? And the answer is that well, the software might be easier to change by the very definition of software and therefore bug, but it's also easier to inspect. The complexity of hardware makes implants very hard to find. And Bloomberg's opinion on this was that Supermicro was built to take advantage of global supply chains. Many of its motherboards, the clusters of chips and circuitry that run modern electronics, were manufactured in China by contractors, then assembled into surface in the US and elsewhere. So you've got this very complicated worldwide supply chain and you've got to work out who is able to attack you and who has the incentive to do so. Who along the supply chain could get to you? Uh, and it's not always the easiest targets like the software. There are many other examples of this. Uh, in the lecture notes, there's also an example from a very innocent looking court document. Uh, we learn on page 72 that uh, this also happened to Lenovo laptops sold to the US military, that uh, they were repeatedly finding bugs inside of them because they'd been tampered with via a, a similar mechanism. One of the most popular devices available today is the, the mobile phone, where 
the security of the platform of a mobile phone is a difficult question because it's difficult to know who is in charge. If you've got a sort of old dumb phone like this, you have a chip designer, a chip maker, an OS vendor, a handset original equipment manufacturer and a mobile network operator, most of which will be distinct companies. And so there's security fragmented uh, along the supply chain while each one will try and pass the buck to a different one in the supply chain. So it's not in any of their incentives to fix the security. Uh, you typically wouldn't get software updates at all because no one in this chain cared. Uh, nowadays, there's a lot less uh, heterogeneity in the software stack too. So this is uh, even more scary because everyone's using the same devices. If you find a bug in a piece of software or in some hardware, you can exploit it almost everywhere. And that means that that's changed the calculus of nation state attacks, for example, where if your adversaries are using the exact same devices as you, uh, that gives you a disclosure issue where if you keep a zero dose silent to, to use it yourself against your enemy, if they find it in the meantime, they can use it against you. Now, for Android, this changes a little bit because now the software really is all coming from Google. But we still have many different actors along this chain, right? We've got the chip that's coming from perhaps Qualcomm and or ARM. We've got the chip maker, TSMC or Samsung. Uh, we've got the OS vendor, who is Google. We've got the OEM HTC and the mobile network operator, which is maybe EE or uh, O2 or somebody. Updates through this propagate through the chain upwards. So if you've got a bug in the hardware that uh, can maybe be fixed by a firmware update or a microcode update, it has to pass up this chain uh, and be approved at each of the stages to actually get to any device. And we should ask the question of who is motivated to even fix an issue in these devices. Uh, most of the people in this chain actually make money per device sold. So why would they have an incentive to fix an old device? Surely they want to sell you a new device. There's probably only Google in this that's incentivized to fix any of these bugs for the most part. And we know from security economics that unless whoever can fix it pays the costs, then we know that bad things will happen. And there's all sorts of bad things that happen in the Android ecosystem. And we'll look at uh, uh, mitigation attempts on those later. So why is it that uh, Google is perhaps the most motivated to fix things in that hierarchy? Uh, well, one reason is because Android is free and therefore Google don't make money on the sale of new phones except from their own phones, their say Google Pixel series. So why is Android free? Uh, well, it's because it's a complementary good. The operating system is subsidized by the default search engine and app store, which are both Google based where they make money from the ads and from commission on the app store itself. Since Google is the only one who is motivated to patch devices for a long time, there are implications here for security economics. Whereas in the Apple ecosystem, it's a lot more vertically integrated. Apple uh, in this uh, right from the bottom, they design their own chips, though yes, they're still made by TSMC and Samsung. Um, the OS vendor is Apple, the original equipment manufacturer is Apple. Uh, the only one who is not in this chain uh, that Apple really doesn't have any say is the mobile network operator. And so the big win that Apple had and Google to this, a similar extent, but uh, really the big innovation that Apple had with the iPhone over the dumb phones that came before it was that they managed to break the mobile network operator's control over updates in that these days you update your iPhone by connecting it via USB to iTunes or over Wi-Fi. Uh, in fact, you can't even update iPhones by the 4G connection, whereas in the past it would have been the only mechanism to do the updates that would have been entirely in the MNO's control who just want to sell you a new phone rather than fix your old one. This meant that because Apple had this semi-closed platform, which they control most of the ecosystem uh, that transferred the power away from the mobile network operator to the OEM, to Apple. And Apple updates their devices for about five years, whereas Android devices probably updated for three if you're lucky. Uh, and it's because of reasons of security economics and who is incentivized to keep things up to date. 
But that's not the only ecosystem story in mobile phones. Uh, I've mentioned already that Google makes its money through the App Store. That's why it's a complimentary good. That's why the OS is free. And in these scenarios, uh, Google and Apple make money from the sale of third party software and uh, audio and video. Uh, they take 30% of revenue from their app stores, uh, though Google has gone to 15% for the first $1 million recently. But the point is they take a sizable chunk of this and therefore they have an incentive to cultivate this ecosystem to make it pay the best for them. And that impacts on the security as well, as we'll talk about later. Now, actually, on Android, which is a semi-open ecosystem, uh, that leads to alternative markets without the same security ecosystem that Google has for its Google Play. And if you get a sort of standard Google Pixel device, uh, these will all be disabled by default, uh, both for security reasons, because Google can't uh, look at what's happening inside them uh, as easily, but also for monopoly reasons, because Google takes the cut from the Google Play Store, but not from the Amazon App Store or the Huawei App Gallery. And in all of these app stores, most of the apps are somewhat predatory. Even those that are perhaps sideloaded by the original equipment manufacturer might be somewhat predatory. Uh, might try to steal your data, might try to sell you things, might have all sorts of hallmarks of potentially unwanted software, and might sideload apps that you didn't really want. But also an app store is a form of lock-in. Uh, having you buy all of your software on the Google ecosystem or the uh, iOS ecosystem, when you're coming to buy a new phone, do you really want to get rid of all of that software that you've bought and buy it again? No. So you trap people in by making them build up a library on your ecosystem. So if we take a look at the top of the charts on Google Play here, uh, we've got three different categories. Uh, uh, we've got uh, free over in this corner, paid in this corner, and top grossing in this corner. And you'll notice that the top paid uh, doesn't share anything in common with the top grossing. Uh, because most apps end up free and ad supported, uh, slash supported by theft of your personal data, slash by microtransaction. Uh, there's a market failure in this ecosystem for premium apps. And so that's one of the other reasons why most of the apps that are successful are somewhat predatory, because that's the only way to make money. And of course, this has implications for security, even though it's an economics uh, perspective. And we've talked in the past about the many isolation features and uh, permission settings in Android that try to isolate apps from each other to stop the fact that, yes, you know they're all predatory, but at least they aren't going to steal your banking information because they can't. Um, but one of the access controls that Android doesn't support is internet access control privacy, uh, which is something that even the BlackBerry had. It's so important to have internet uh, access for the ad ecosystem, which is conveniently also dominated by Google, that there is no way to disable this for ads except from installing your own firewall. It's not a default feature in the Google ecosystem. Uh, but the ad ecosystem is also a rat's nest with many moderate sized actors that are unknown to users and that do all sorts of shady stuff. So if we look at uh, these, which are just uh, two top uh, free applications, one is supported primarily by in-app purchases, the other by ads, uh, adverts end up executing inside the application sandbox. So even though we have all of these nice isolation features, the ads run inside the sandbox and inherit the provisions of the app itself. So the threats from this are enormously wide, uh, from loading insecure code to stealing user information. And likewise, uh, app developers return the favor with uh, fake clicks, uh, just like malware developers, to steal money from the advert vendors. So everyone is out to get everybody in this complex ecosystem. And you find that the amount of data collected is very wide ranging. It's not just a trying to sell people stuff. It's also analytics where the data is money and you giving away your personal data is very valuable to the operators of applications in the app stores. And even paid apps therefore tend to collect lots of personal data. And usually when you've got a free and paid pairs, the paid versions, which you might assume will be more secure and less likely to steal your data because, hey, you've paid for them, right? Uh, they tend to have the same permissions in practice and uh, often tend to collect much of the same data. 
Right, so I've mentioned that there are usually multiple different app stores installed on devices. And that's because, uh, as well as Google, who will install their Google Play, you'll probably get an app store from the uh, original equipment manufacturer and perhaps another one from the mobile network operator. And because all of these have a level of control over the operating system that gets installed on the phone, even though it's based on Google's Android, uh, you often get apps that are pre-installed as well that have uh, unusual custom permissions and don't get updated and can't be removed. Uh, so as well as their custom app stores, you've got custom apps on the device already. And this is often quite a complex source of uh, both ads and Trojan loaders that you can't get rid of. Uh, a prime example being the uh, Amazon uh, Fire devices, which though they're based on Google's operating system, uh, come with Amazon's ads all over the place because they control the device and have a modified version of the operating system with their own app store. Now, while Google has this problem of operating system update fragmentation, where the updates are in the control of the OEMs at least, and possibly the mobile network operators if the phone isn't unlocked, so you don't get updates for very long, three years if you're lucky, the Google Play Store itself is much better at doing updates uh, because the App Store makes uh, app update automatic. Uh, you don't get the same fragmentation. And so a lot of the work on security in Android over the past few years has been pushing more of the core functionality into Google Play itself from the OEM controlled operating systems. Uh, the prime example being that before Android 4, there was this thing called Browser, which was updated by when the operating system was updated, so never, and Chrome replaced it, which was updated via Google Play. And so your browser now gets the security updates it needs because of this tussle of control between the OEMs and mobile network operators and the platform operator Google, where they have full control over Google Play. So the way that Google Play works is that uh, apps are self-signed by application developers. Uh, they have a known public key, which they keep the private key of, and that signs the binary so that any changes to that binary won't match the signature and therefore won't install. Uh, iOS goes for a similar but slightly different model where it's uh, Apple that sign those applications, but they're still signed. The default is Google have their way is to keep users using only Google Play, both for security because you don't want apps from unknown sources that Google can't vet, but also for lock-in because uh, Google don't want you to give anyone else that 30% slash 15% commission. Within the Google ecosystem, there's this thing called the App Security Improvement Program, which scans the Google Play Store for vulnerabilities in any of the apps that are on there, as well as your device itself for harmful apps, because not all of the apps on your phone will come from the Google Play Store. And why do they do that? Uh, that's because their ecosystem matters to them because that's how they make their money. If people lose trust in the Google Play ecosystem, People stop buying apps on there. People stop paying Google commission. They perhaps move to Apple devices instead. So actually, Google give you this whole suite of tools to help you make apps that are more secure. Sanitizers and mitigators for user code. And they've got Bansan for band checking code. Adasan for looking for memory safety errors. Intsan for integer overflow errors. Shadow stacks for detecting when your return function value has been modified by a stack smashing attack. The Scudo hardened allocator, which is the new allocator in Google's operating system. Uh, they used to use JE malloc, which is a rival allocator, uh, that is meant to find lots of bugs by things like randomization and report on them if they appear. So they've got this whole ecosystem. Actually, a lot of the work in driving software safety over the past few years has come from Google for this reason. Um, and this isn't just about protecting Android, the operating system, then. It's about protecting the entire ecosystem. If you extract rent from an ecosystem, you need to protect the third-party code, too. Now, Android, the operating system, is a free operating system. It's open source. Uh, the Linux kernel it's based on is uh, GPL. The code on top of that that doesn't interface directly with the Linux kernel is uh, Apache 2 licensed. But the Google Play Tools Store ecosystem is an open source. 
Now I've mentioned that Android phones typically only get updated for three years if you're lucky and a lot less if you're unlucky. And actually Google provide monthly patches. They provide a full patch cycle to fix bugs in the operating system itself. And we've got an example here of where you can check in about phone that gives you both the uh, software update of the system and the level of security patches from Google that have been integrated into that operating system. But actually often these are deployed very late. They aren't deployed monthly because it takes a lot of time to get into the devices. Why is this? Why is it that devices are only patched for three years and tend to get patches late if at all? Well, it's because the Google update lifecycle is really complicated. So when we have an Android dessert release over here, all of Android's uh, numbered operating systems are named after different kinds of uh, sweet desserts. Uh, you first go to the silicon manufacturer partners. That includes people like uh, ARM at the architecture level and selling IP and uh, perhaps uh, TSMC and Samsung who are actually building the chips and also the system on chip providers who uh, customize and add silicon specific code to make it work with their systems on chip. Then we go to the device manufacturers, uh, the OEMs who customize with their own and carrier requirements through the carriers of the mobile network operators, uh, which then goes to the carrier, who are the device makers who seek technical acceptance. So once the carrier has approved all of that, it finally gets to the end users, right? Complicated. Most of the people in this chain don't want anything to do with this. Why would they? Uh, security economics. So the inevitability is that the Android ecosystem has very poor after sales support as it's in control of the OEMs who want to sell you new devices and are struggling to keep up with the patch cycle. This is a lot of engineering effort. In 2015, 80% of devices in the ecosystem had known vulnerabilities. So who cares about zero days when most devices just aren't up to date? Google are trying to solve this by regaining control over this patch cycle and you get uh, security bulletins from Google that explain the bugs in devices. But the propagation cycle for this is bewilderingly complicated. Let's say if you found a bug in OpenSSL, which uh, as we know is famous from the Heartbleed vulnerability, that would then propagate to Linux, which would then propagate to Android, which would then propagate to the OEM, which would then propagate to the mobile network operators if it's a locked device. Android have gone through a series of different steps to try and improve the horror that is this update ecosystem. In the past, because mobile phone network operators and OEMs were allowed to change the code uh, to suit their new device and put in all of the terrible features they wanted, you had your previous Android release where there was this previous framework and all of this stuff that the vendor had added. And when there's an updated framework, they had to redo everything to make it work, which understandably they didn't want to do and they weren't incentivized to anyway. Even if they wanted to patch, there was a lot of work here. So Google have tried to fix this with this thing called Treble, which uh, came with Android Oreo first, uh, released in 2017, which is Android 8. In this case, the idea is that you can update all of the Google stuff by separating it from, with this special interface to anything the vendor wants to change. The vendor isn't allowed to change anything up here, but can change stuff down here. Uh, the OEM still has to push these updates though, in that the OEM is still involved, even if the work for them is lesser. And they still have very little incentive to do this. So we then get to Project Mainline, which is from Android 10 onwards in 2019. This is doing the thing I was talking about earlier, which is moving more of the operating system parts into the Google Play infrastructure, which Google have complete control over to make the patching indirect control of Google. This is again, like the browser to Chrome example that I was talking about earlier, where Chrome is Play Store controlled and browser was included and unupdatable. But this also has the effect of moving more code into the closed source Google Play services from the open source uh, Apache slash GPL uh, Android open source project where the Linux kernels GPL and the rest is Apache. So there are implications here for 
visibility of the code and openness of the ecosystem if you can use the Android open source project without using Google Play. So this has an effect for devices that don't fully buy in to the Google ecosystem, even when they use Google's operating system. Now, other ways that security manifests in the Android app ecosystem are from a chip vendor, i.e. Trust Zone from ARM, and they've recently announced their confidential compute architecture, which is all about virtualization, uh, but using a similar sort of enclave technology. Um, the issue with all of these is that actually, again, there's an ecosystem problem, that there's OEM variation even within Trust Zone. Uh, so these have proved to be too awkward to use. And most app developers don't use Trust Zone because you have to customize for every single OEM. So app developers have turned to obfuscation instead. Trust Zone itself was only opened up when SGX was released by Intel, so arrival. The rest of the time, it's been in devices for probably 15 years now, a little bit longer. And initially, it was just to secure the baseband. That's the only thing the Enclave was used for. Obfuscation is where you don't have any hardware Enclave support or you don't use it. Rather, you let the user see everything, but you try and hide it away in ways. So hide the keys, uh, check for presence of uh, machine fingerprints, uh, dongles, license servers to check whether you're running it in the environment that you think you are rather than having any real attestation. You might move things to the cloud to have a server that you're responding to that is in your control. Or you might just move things around a lot in your code to make it so that people who discover how your security works and can therefore reverse engineer it won't be able to use that information for very long. A lot of it is less science and more art because it's very difficult to measure how well something is obfuscated. Uh, but nevertheless, it's part of security standards in banking. Similarly, there's this uh, technique called RASP or Runtime Application Self-Protection, where within your application, you'll monitor what it's running on and uh, instrument various parameters of the system to work out whether uh, it's being uh, monitored in some way to try and give it some more security. Of course, the problem with all of those things is that because there's no real protection from obfuscation or RASP, you could just remove them with a debugger, right? Uh, for this reason, a lot of closed ecosystems will only run signed code that uh, hasn't been tampered with in any way so that you can't just remove the say, copyright check, for example. But obfuscation conflicts with sustainability in that it's more difficult to debug and fix something that is difficult to understand, right? And malware writers also use obfuscation. Uh, you use packers and polymorphic headers to decrypt code that is your payload of the virus so that it won't match known signatures. And the state of the art in obfuscation is using a virtual machine in the Java virtual machine sense, i.e. not as in the virtualization sense where you've got a guest and host, in the virtual machine sense where you've got an imaginary instruction set architecture. Uh, with a unusual instruction set, you place all of your crypto inside and then obfuscate the virtual machine. Android Key Store is something that you get, which is a layer above Trust Zone, uh, an API to provide key storage, and uh, you can also use this on other crypto processors too. Uh, but uh, root malware can pretend to be the app and get the keys anyway. Phones will be locked by the mobile network operator to keep you using uh, their SIMs inside it and paying them for your contract. Uh, they lock you in by selling you a subsidized device and then selling you a more expensive contract so you can't use the phone with someone else. The issue there for the mobile network operator is that the device is in the custody of the attacker. You've got all of the issues around tamper proofing that you have with any other device that is kept by your attacker. And actually, that's an example of where this kind of lock-in has been deemed to be unlawful in the UK, and actually mobile phone network operators are being banned from selling locked phones for this reason. Now, back to Apple, which has a rival ecosystem for mobile phones in iOS, which is a semi-closed ecosystem. You can't have things like the Amazon Store or the uh, Huawei App Gallery on the iPhone. All of the apps go through the App Store uh, with the caveat you can have uh, software within a single company with self-signed keys, uh, but only for a limited number of devices and they can be revoked by Apple at any point. 
but in the general ecosystem, it all goes through Apple and it's all signed by Apple. Again, they get 30% commission on products sold through their app stores, including in-app purchases. And again, there are antitrust issues in this ecosystem where Apple will claim that they need to do this for security, but uh, of course they also make a lot of money out of it. There was a recent lawsuit with Epic Games where Apple were forced to allow Epic Games to redirect to a website to allow payment where they didn't give Apple 30% commission. A big problem with this closed ecosystem is that the rules on that commission are quite arbitrary. Uh, Amazon was allowed in April 2020 to sell movies on iOS without giving Apple a cut, but what if you're not Amazon? What if you're not that powerful? Uh, dating websites have to give 30%, Uber doesn't. Uh, this is arbitrary, right? Apple is so vertically integrated that they actually have incentives to patch jailbreaks, unlike the mobile network operators on Android devices. Uh, there are occasionally unpatchable vulnerabilities in deployed devices, uh, check rain and checkmate, which were on the boot ROM, so it's not like this is a foolproof ecosystem. Uh, but there is a lot more patching that goes on because there's so much more vertical integration and the incentives are better aligned. Still, unlike AOSP, it's all closed source for the most part. Uh, so there is obscurity, but is it really part of the security? Apple make a big deal about being a secure and private vendor of operating systems, uh, but it's often quite hard to vet that. Again, the ecosystem matters. Uh, Apple claim that they give you more privacy than Google, and they really do with this uh, Apple ID for advertisers. This changes targeted advertising from opt-out to opt-in. But it does mean that it tangles with Apple's own ad business, right? If Apple have all the visibility of the device and no one else has this permission to track you, then this changes the dynamic of the ecosystem of ads in Apple's favor and in nobody else's. Apple presents itself as the company of privacy compared with Google's ad-based ecosystem where Google makes a ton of money out of ads. But this has its limits. Apple's neural match, which they proposed and quickly retracted in 2021, was a system that used uh, machine learning to attempt to detect translation invariant copies of uh, uh, child abuse material uh, being uploaded to the iCloud. And Ha 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 ha, they still have a end-to-end -end private system, right? Because uh, they do all of the checking on this on the device and somehow that's uh, not worse. And as it turned out, the actual defense against uh, child abuse material was very limited itself because it was only comparing against uh, known images in a known database rather than protecting against any new images. And because of the messy questions this caused around what else you're put into the upload filter that checks things on devices while still claiming to have end-to-end -end security. Uh, this has at least for now been uh, nixed and you can read more into this in the articles that are in the notes of the lecture slides. Now apps in App Store ecosystems can go bad for all sorts of reasons. Uh, they might not start off bad even though many of them are malicious. They might be naturally malicious, the libraries that they use might go bad or buggy, uh, they might just be using stuff that uh, isn't looked after properly. Uh, they might be bought by malicious companies. Uh, there was a big crime ring called uh, We Purchase Apps that did hundreds of millions of dollars of ad fraud by buying apps and using the user data within to train bots that then clicked on ads. So the fraud was actually on the ad providers here. Uh, there was a very famous case of uh, cam scanner which was and is a reputable app which started dropping trojans on phones where what was happening here is that their ad network was malicious and so their ad network poisoned the entire app and made it malicious too note the difference here between google's ecosystem and the windows ecosystem where the Google's ecosystem actively assumes that apps will be at least a little bit malicious, and so it will isolate and contain them. 
whereas in the Windows ecosystem, uh, everything gets global visibility. With the antivirus software allowed to see everything, Google's is the more modern operating system and perhaps the more sound choice given all of the issues around antiviruses that we've discussed already. Uh, but if you've got an ecosystem that's as open as Windows is, you don't have a lot of choice. You can't change it at this point. Google still has trouble in its App Store ecosystem with this concept called repackaging, where you take an app and repackage it, so the app is the carrier, with harmful code, which is the rider. Uh, in 2010, what this was used for was premium rate calls. You download the app that you thought was the proper app, but it was actually uploaded by someone else and signed with the other person's key. So it, it all looks legitimate, right? Uh, it's a signed application by a nobody, but it looks like the app you want. But by 2018, uh, rather than premium rate calls, these things now do ad fraud and exfiltration of personal data to make the money. Uh, the threats are all entangled because they change based on which exfiltration mechanism is easiest to make money from rather than just the vulnerability in the device. So a lot of people attack Windows, but uh, why is Windows so insecure is a common quote that you hear. And medical and defense have managed to build dependable devices that are secure for a very long time. So why was Windows 95 and 98 and all previous uh, versions of Windows like 3.1 totally defenseless? No distinction between user or kernel at all. Everything can see everything and everything has ultimate power. Well, it's to do with the market ecosystem. If, as in most tech ecosystems, the battle is for the market, not in the market, you don't compete with people, you try and get the market and therefore control it forever and ever and ever and get the monopoly. The right thing to do is subsidize third party software by making it as cheap to develop for your operating system over anyone else's as possible. And so you relax the security requirements, right? You don't let all of those nasty security features get in the way of people deploying for your operating system really quickly and you getting all of the ecosystem of the third party software and so people buying you the middleman's operating system. Now, this is the concept of a two sided market where Windows's customers are both the app developers and the people who then buy the apps in turn. So it's rational to get as much poorly written software as quickly as possible. Uh, that gives you this concept of an initial versus sustained velocity, where the idea is that if you do this and make security really rubbish early on, once you then have a mature ecosystem where people start to worry about the security because people start getting attacked, it then becomes a lot harder to fix. Uh, you get this issue of a trade-off with sustained velocity, where you hit into so much technical debt of things that you have to start patching around with weird behavior that it becomes so expensive to maintain the ecosystem that you'd be better off uh, having thought about security in the first place. Uh, and it's Google's argument that sustained velocity is the right way to go, actually. And so there is no misaligned incentive. Uh, but hey, Google have uh, lots of uh, market dominant uh, businesses. Uh, they're not a startup. So they're able to say that the approach of Microsoft with Windows, which was ship it Tuesday and get it right by version three, is a coherent thing to do. It was the right thing to do for them to take the market, even though it meant that everything was really buggy and really insecure. Uh, the incentives then are not just for poor security in applications and operating systems and ecosystems, but also dumping security costs on the user. This is bargains then ripoffs. Still, to be more favorable to Microsoft, uh, to quote uh, Nicole Perlroth's book, uh, where she paraphrases hackers, uh, I would always make the point of asking hackers, I know you hate the vendors, but of all of them, who do you hate least? The answer was always the same. Microsoft, they would tell me. They turned their around. From XP onwards, where Microsoft got more serious about security because it was harming their ecosystem, because people were leaving it, because they were getting attacked, Windows changed tack to have a distinct user and kernel mode. Uh, you gave away free security tools, free antivirus software, free firewalls. Uh, all of their staff had secure coding training that was mandatory. Uh, they've put
put this great effort into sorting out their patch cycle with this idea of Patch Tuesday, where you issue all of your patches and distribute them to everybody. And you test absolutely everything on lots and lots of servers with all of the apps in the ecosystem that people care about. But not all of this was for the user's benefit. Actually, if you look into the finer detail, a lot of Microsoft security effort went into protecting premium video, uh, DRM, rather than protecting credit card numbers that uh, the end users actually care about. So it might be security, but it might not be security for you. Microsoft really have hit up against this issue with technical debt, where what might a uh, patch to fix a bug break in the Windows software ecosystem? Well, Windows has basically allowed its apps to do pretty much anything in the name of getting as much software as possible. And so you have these popular applications that rely on all sorts of undefined behavior uh, with legacy code that assumes it's running as admin. And so sustained velocity really starts to bite you. What you have, therefore, in the Windows ecosystem is something where you run basically big rigs full of servers that run all of the popular software every time you do an update. And it's regression testing at scale, not just on Microsoft's code, but everybody else's. And you add features to ease the compatibility issues while trying to keep security. Windows have tried to change that ecosystem here to make it more secure. There was this thing called the Universal Windows app, which uh, came from Microsoft's App Store, where everything was run in a managed environment. The idea was that you were meant to run it using a common language runtime languages like C Sharp, and that was what you were meant to program in for all of your apps. But they just didn't have the clout to make it stick. Uh, if you've got all of this software that won't run as a universal Windows app, everyone will use other apps and therefore will get apps from other sources. Programmability and compatibility make changing ecosystems once you've deployed them in favor of security very difficult. Still, it does mean that apps that you get from the Windows Store will still run in a jail, even though they don't have to run in the common language runtime anymore. And because Microsoft market dominance relied on them having this open ecosystem where you could run basically anything, that actually allows you to create ecosystems on top of ecosystems. Uh, you've got Steam, for example, where Steam has a software business on top of Windows where they collect 30%, not Microsoft and they deal with the security of obfuscation. And that's the price of running an open ecosystem. Uh, so why do it? It's all about economic factors and therefore you get the, as well as the economic implications, you also get the security implications where Microsoft just don't have that much visibility. But not all of this is Windows' fault, right? Uh, Windows as the dominant operating system for a long time ends up with a network effect of bads. Uh, so attackers gain more money by attacking the Windows ecosystem over uh, Mac OS X. Uh, and you also get a market for lemons on software or drivers that we've talked about already, where everything ends up terrible because it's easier to write terrible things and therefore it's easier to get terrible things to market and take the market. Now, Microsoft don't just have the Windows ecosystem, they're moving to a new ecosystem, like everyone else, the cloud. Uh, so this is uh, Microsoft's Azure, where this isn't just about using Microsoft server hardware. There is an ecosystem here, a software ecosystem, where every cloud network operator has their own set of tools. Uh, that's partly about giving you security, and part of the value in moving to the cloud is about amortizing the cost of security response. Uh, sharing the burden of security and automated logging with everyone else in the cloud ecosystem. Uh, it's about 10% of Microsoft Azure's engineering effort is in cybersecurity. But again, you get lock-in here because you are using different software in the different cloud ecosystems. Microsoft's auditing in their cloud is a combination of many different tools. So compliance reporting, where you get told if you're doing something wrong and to fix it, uh, threat modeling, uh, managing risks of third party components, uh, penetration testing. Uh, these are all done automatically for you to help you run something, uh, a web application in a secure way. So you don't have to pay as much of the cost for that yourself and your own engineers. But because of the bargains then ripoffs effects, you get stuck if you want to move to different cloud providers. Now, because of this move to the cloud, uh, if you're a bank using cloud infrastructure, the HSM, the hardware security module that stores all of the bank secrets are actually not in the hands of the bank anymore. They're in the hands of uh, Azure and Amazon in each of their respective ecosystems. Uh, and each has around 2,000 of these 
HSNs each. Uh, in Azure, if you're running services in the cloud, uh, they use what is called a double encryption DRM uh, to make regulated industries, e.g. banks, uh, happier to use the services. At REST, you bring your own key uh, that's stored in Microsoft's vault, so you supply your own key, and it's encrypted with the platform keys too. In Transit, you have a TLS on the outward links, so HTTPS style security, and uh, MACSEC between data centers on the backbone links, because we know from the uh, Snowden revelations that uh, the backbone between data centers is a prime place to attack. But it's not clear from Microsoft's official documentation whether they use encryption inside the data center between different data center servers. Google certainly do. And a lot of data is neither in transit nor at rest. It's being calculated on, right? And the solution at the moment for that is enclaves, where you have to trust the hardware provider, Intel, but not necessarily the data center. And some of the other tools they offer you uh, based around enclaves actually are uh, the Cloud Key Vault, which will store your keys separate from your code uh, via SGX, so that just from having access to the code doesn't mean you can break all of the security. It's not just devices and App Store ecosystems that have complicated uh, supply chains. Uh, code itself is a rat's nest. Uh, if you've got an application, can an insider unintentionally or intentionally get bad code committed to your release? Uh, there was this uh, slightly notorious example in 2021 called Hypocrite Commits, which was a paper that got accepted and then forcibly retracted from uh, Security and Privacy, aka Oakland, at one of the top security conferences, that revealed that it was quite easy to get vulnerable code into the Linux kernel. And who is an insider from the perspective of software running in your device? If you've got an open source software like Linux, uh, there will be thousands of contributors from all over the world. Uh, are you really meant to trust all of them? Um, it's worse than that because it's not just the kernel, it's all of the libraries that you're using. That uh, the provenance of the code from that might be really difficult to work out and involve lots and lots of people. These mechanisms that's meant to deal with that, uh, code review on patches to these uh, projects, uh, are a form of multi-party authorization. The idea is that someone else should check to see if this is a bug that's being uh, maliciously added or whether it's uh, innocent code. Uh, but it can be very difficult to avoid rubber stamping. It can be very difficult to have the capability to check code for bugs in this way for intentional error. And it's also very difficult to avoid rubber stamping for the sake of reducing effort. So you've got to build a culture that really does reject patches if they look sketchy and put in the effort and uh, economic incentives to make that checking worthwhile. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. Because in this scenario, bugs aren't random anymore. They're introduced to open source projects on purpose with very wide use. And so this commoditizes supply chain attacks. It means that anyone can pull one off as long as they can get a bug into any piece of software that anybody uses. And of course, with open source, uh, a lot of software is used by a lot of people. But you've got to be aware of who makes the decision to integrate patches into your products, right? Uh, if you're relying on lots of external libraries, you might not even have visibility of that code, and you certainly might not be able to tell who is contributing to it. A typical way to deal with this is to perhaps keep an internal version of all of your external libraries that you use, where you review upstream patches as they appear rather than automatically integrating them in. And you make your entire build system uh, stored with the code in this uh, idea of configuration as code, so that people can't change what is happening in the build uh, by changing uh, slight differences in the configuration, because the configuration is code that gets committed and gets run automatically. So everything has that level of multi-party authorization visibility. The compiler is part of your trusted code base. It's not just the source code. Uh, binary provenance needs to include every part of the build step, not only for bugs in the compiler, but also because the compiler command line arguments have very strong rewriting powers. Uh, in GCC, for example, uh, the dflags argument allows you to totally replace lines of code. 
So if you just have visibility over the code but not the configuration, you've got a problem. Code signing can help you work out the provenance of code too because you can work out who has built it by who has access to the private keys. But you've got to be very careful of your keys leaking and also of who has keys to sign things. If you're in the Windows ecosystem, there are lots of valid signing certificates out there. Uh, you can buy one for a thousand dollars that will let you do basically anything from someone who's received that privilege in the past. So it's not that secure unless you lock down to very specific vendors. And that brings us back to zero days, which we discussed in the first lecture, but we can now look at as an ecosystem. So suppose you discover a vulnerability, whether you're a customer, an academic, a contractor for an intelligence agency, a criminal, do you sell it on a vulnerability market, whether uh, salubrious or more malicious? Do you sell it to a cyber arms manufacturer? Do you exploit it yourself if you're a government operator? Or do you give it into a bug bounty program of a vendor or disclose it to them for free? Suppose you decide to sell it over on the right hand side to someone who wants to use it to attack people. Even they have a choice as to whether to use it on very specific targets or use it on lots of them, where if you use zero days too much, then they get reported and fixed, so you're back to square one. If you decide to disclose it for free or via bug bounty program, then you will have to choose whether you only need to disclose it to one company or whether there's an ecosystem of companies that rely on that product and you need to do coordinated vulnerability disclosure to avoid everyone else who uses that product having their own zero day as a result that they haven't patched. Uh, we discussed in the first lecture about uh, the meltdown vulnerability and disguising it as a patch for a lesser vulnerability, which meant that it could be deployed without telling everyone in the Linux ecosystem what the bug was where you can't trust all of the members in the ecosystem who would be affected. Even then, when you decide to do the right thing, and even if you decide to do it for free, then the company you disclose to also has a choice. Will they do the right thing and patch the bug and protect the customers in their ecosystem who use their software? Or will they just threaten to sue you, not fix the problem that you so generously reported to them? That sounds like an insane thing to do, but the incentives are misaligned. The vendors will have an expensive patch to perform, uh, not only on fixing the code, but also on indemnity for having had a bug in their code in the first place and causing real damage to others. Uh, customers have the hassle of patching uh, once the patch is released, and often there's external harm as well, where once the patch gets disclosed, you can start using it on other systems that haven't been patched. The incentives for the security researcher to disclose things are fame, cash, maybe a fix. Uh, for intelligence agencies, it's to either exploit or patch, depending how vulnerable they think they are. For security software, it's great if there are lots of vulnerabilities in code. It gives you the justification to sell your firewall and antivirus software. If you're a large company or a government department, then your incentive is to try and avoid fixing simply because of how expensive it is to update all of the computers in your ecosystem. A lot of the consensus has moved towards public disclosure after a limited window where you allow the company to fix it, uh, purely because that seems to be the best way to actually get a fix out there. Of course, there's the trade-off. Uh, is it that uh, bugs are reverse engineered from other bugs and therefore public disclosure makes things less safe? Or does disclosure force a fix? Because without the disclosure, the companies are incentivized to ignore the problem and sue you. Automatic updates and vulnerability markets have meant that there's been a real shift to the latter because there's the real capability to deploy patches in a very widespread way nowadays. But not everybody is up to date. Yes, most of the Soft, big software companies run bug bounty programs, though not all of them in a very successful way that actually incentivizes people to give them bugs. Uh, if you're going to make more money from selling it on a vulnerability market, then uh, you, the company, need to be careful. Volkswagen have been suing responsible disclosures. Uh, 
legacy industries like that haven't caught on yet, unlike the big software hitters. In the example I'm talking about with Volkswagen, it was that the researchers had disclosed to the key entry system supplier of which the bug was in, uh, but not Volkswagen themselves, who only found out at the last minute, where, again, coordinated disclosure is very difficult. So the incentives for most bugs are to blame shift, uh, both to partners in your ecosystem, uh, we've talked about this in the mobile phone ecosystem, but even within teams in the same company, if you have a bug disclosed to you, will it be the case that your compiler team and your hardware team will just fight over whose responsibility it is? Ross gave me an example of his uh, BIDI attack works, which are about uh, using Unicode characters to create uh, invisible sequences of uh, characters in programming languages and on uh, translators that uh, cause the wrong results and cause bad things to happen, where the fix for this, there are many places you could build it in, whether it's in the compiler that refuses to compile these weird sequences, in the code editor that shows them up for what they really are, in the build environment which checks for them, or the repositories like GitHub that uh, mark them out as being uh, bad code smells. And with the fighting and all of this, the easiest deployment method, or, or the most comprehensive, may not be actually the cheapest. So the choice can be very difficult. Right, so the final topic of the day is accessory control. You're selling products and you want to control what the end users will do with them so that they'll give you more money. Classic example of this is the razors and blades model, aka two-part pricing, where what you do is you sell the razor's stalk and then sell razor cartridges for it. And likewise with printers, you sell the printer off really cheap and then make the ink cartridge more expensive than gold. The trick is bargains and ripoffs, like all lock-in. Android is also a razor and blades model in that you give the software away for free and then collect money through the ad ecosystem and Google Play. In printers, uh, you either, using cryptography, refuse the third-party ink cartridges that aren't made by you, the printer vendor, to work, or you do things like downgrade their performance using cryptography rather than through any fault of the replacement cartridge itself. You'll do things like add expiry dates and digital limitations on the amount of ink dispensed. So even though there is ink inside the cartridge, you'll stop it and force it to not work so someone has to buy a new one. And you'll do things like region coding so you can sell things for different prices in different markets. Now, actually, from the lawsuit in the US, Lexmark versus SCC, on a DNCA violation in 2004, what this meant was that SCC's aftermarket components were deemed perfectly legal, and this created a free market for cryptologists. What this said was that uh, the printer vendors have every right to make their cryptography as complicated as possible, but aftermarket providers of ink cartridges have every right to break all of that cryptography. So each side tries to hire the smartest cryptographers and cryptanalysts, uh, respectively. There are other examples, they're usually quite predatory. Uh, water filters that switch themselves off after a certain amount of time, so that even if there's plenty of life left in the filter, you have to buy a new one. Another example of an accessory controlled ecosystem is video games consoles. So here we have Nintendo. Uh, this is a two-sided market between developer of code and consumer. The more developers, the more consumers, the more consumers, the more developers. Uh, you use DRM to lock in both sides so that the developer has to pay a commission to Nintendo when they sell software. So you use code signing to make sure that only software that's been signed by Nintendo will run. Uh, you use digital rights management to lock in the consumer to only buying legitimate purchases uh, through Nintendo's stores or through their cartridges. And this comes in many flavors, a combination of security printing to make cartridges that are difficult to uh, clone or counterfeit, uh, obfuscation, tamper resistance on those cartridges, internet connected license checks and challenge response protocols. 
And you'll also do challenge response protocols to cryptographic chips inside accessories so that either you only allow first party accessories made by you, the vendor, or you license and charge a commission to anyone else who wants to make an accessory for your ecosystem. But of course, uh, none of these are infallible and there's been attacks on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, in this case, it's because it used a well-known system on chip, the NVIDIA TX1, and so there was a bug in the underlying NVIDIA system on chips, a read-only boot run, which you therefore couldn't fix, and actually the bug was a buffer overflow. But if you're selling products, it's not just your end users you can't trust. When you've got a supply chain with a IP in there, intellectual property, you might have an FPGA bitstream being used for a circuit designed to run on a camera where you license it for $2 per camera. That camera is then produced in a factory. And what you find is that you, the IP vendor, sell licenses for 100,000 cameras and mysteriously find 200,000 on the market. What's happened? Well, it could either be the camera vendor who has decided to lie about how many cameras they're producing, or it could be the factory that's lied to the camera vendor. They could be producing grey market items where they're selling them on the sly. So both have incentives to cheat. And the way you typically get around this is with things like serial numbers and online registration for the camera vendor. So the camera vendor will know if devices are registered that have duplicate certificates. And that keeps the factory honest, but there's still issues for the IP vendor where Often the solution is to only license your best designs to very large firms to reduce them leaking and reduce the chance for malpractice or at least make it obvious. Often with FPGA uh, circuit IP theft, you can't even tell it's been stolen because it's going to be so embedded in the system, it will be very difficult to observe it and measure it. Uh, you end up having to resort to side channels to even find evidence of your intellectual property, your circuits running inside the device. So is accessory control objectionable? It depends how competitive the markets are. In that you know, without all of these complicated mechanisms in place to limit what your supply chain and your users can do, uh, there may be a market failure. You may not be able to bring these products to market. Uh, but as with all software, uh, tech entrenches and causes monopolies, uh, much like the software industry itself. and accessory control is a form of lock-in. And so it traps people into buying expensive uh, replacement cartridges because they've been tricked into buying what they thought was a cheap printer. There's been big tussles in the area around right to repair laws, where vendors will crow that aftermarket products are unsafe to be used in their products. And they may often be right. There is a market lemons for aftermarket goods. If you're buying some random replacement part on eBay, how do you know it's not going to be terrible? How do you detect the terrible ones versus the good ones? So only the terrible ones end up left often. But there's also an issue of sustainability here. Accessory control typically serves to lower the lifetime of products to give more profit to the vendor. And so you end up with uh, cars that you can't repair anymore without legal intervention. Without this, you're going to have real issues of sustainability where things that are perfectly good get thrown away because of artificial limitations put in place by the vendors. Okay, so that's a brief tour through various ecosystems and how security and economics intertwine within them. If you're running an ecosystem, eventually you will struggle with technical debt to keep it secure, even if early on you coax people in by making it insecure and easy to work with. If you're working in a market with two-part pricing, where you sell components afterwards at huge markups, then you will expect to end up in a cryptographic battle with all of the aftermarket suppliers. Who and if you're a member of a complex ecosystem, you've got to be aware of whose incentive it is to actually fix the things and whether those people are actually able to fix it. And if they aren't and you'd be affected, you need to know about it.